This morning I'm continuing the message series called Winning My Battles. And this series will focus upon the Old Testament character named Joshua. And like us, Joshua has some battles that he needs to win. Moses has died. Joshua is Israel's new leader. And Joshua faces the challenge of leading the people to conquer the promised land. This week we focus upon the topic Get past yourself. There are moments in life when we can become our own worst enemy. I have met the enemy, and it's me. I do some things and say some things that get me into trouble. I make bad decisions, and those bad decisions cost me. I must conclude that I have a hard time staying out of my own way and getting past myself. What causes a person to become their own worst enemy? Well, we talk ourselves into making some bad decisions. We know the right thing to do, and we know the wrong thing to do, but we try to convince ourselves that we can do the wrong thing and still get a good result. We know that getting involved with that group of people is not a good idea. But we convince ourselves that everything will be fine. We know that cheating is the wrong thing to do. But we convince ourselves that it won't hurt anybody. We know that lying is a sin. But we convince ourselves that no one will ever discover the truth. We know that hiding things from people is never a wise idea, but we do it anyway. We convince ourselves and talk ourselves into some poor decisions that have the potential to turn us into our own worst enemy. Joshua and the Israelites are on a roll. Everything is going their way. They cross the Jordan River and enter into the Promised Land. They get their first military victory. The walls of Jericho crumble before their eyes. They're on a winning streak. It looks like nothing can stand in their way. Nothing, that is, except themselves. Joshua chapter 6 tells this incredible story of Israel's victory against Jericho. Joshua chapter 7 begins with the ominous word, but. That little conjunction is a hint that a contrast is coming. Victory will give way to defeat. Miracle will give way to misery. Celebration will give way to crisis. The Israelites will become their own worst enemy. Someone can't get past himself. Someone can't get out of his own way. That someone is a man named Achan. His name means trouble. And he's about to bring trouble upon himself and upon all the Israelites. Achan makes some bad decisions that even causes Joshua to become his own worst enemy by making some bad decisions of his own. If you have your Bible, I invite you to open it to the Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter 7. We find Achan's distressing story, beginning with Joshua, chapter 7, and verse 1. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai, 
Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Verse 16. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes, and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward, and the Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by families, and Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family come forward, man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Verse 24. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had, to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will, will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest... They burned them. Following their astonishing victory at Jericho, the Israelites have a hard time dealing with their next military challenge. Success makes them sloppy and careless. Joshua makes a poor decision. Achan can't get past himself. Neither can get out of their own way, and the result proves to be a disaster both for them and for everybody close to them. We become our own worst enemy when we convince ourselves that we can do the wrong thing and still get a good result. So today, I want to share four false beliefs from this story about Joshua and Achan. Now, these four false beliefs are not limited or unique to this story. We, too, try to convince ourselves that these false beliefs are correct. So as we take a close look at them today, let me encourage you to be honest with yourself. How many of these four false beliefs have you put to the test in your own life? False belief number one, I can handle the little things without God. The Israelites have just celebrated a great victory. Jericho has fallen. Joshua next sets his sights on a city called Ai. And like Joshua did before taking Jericho, verse 2 states that Joshua sent out some spies to inspect the land. The spies return in verse 3, and they give Joshua this report. Look, there's not a lot of fighting men at Ai. They're not going to be a problem for us. We don't even have to send the whole army up there to fight. Just choose two or 3,000 men to go to the battle. We can handle this with ease. Joshua accepts the spy's report in verse 4, and he sends 3,000 men into battle. But this time, Israel is defeated. 
Verse 5 says that the men of Ai rout the Israelites. They basically win the skirmish, and 36 Israelites lose their life in that battle. 36 men is not a lot, but this stuns and staggers Israel. This is their first defeat. I mean, how in the world can you defeat Jericho and then turn around and lose at Ai? Well, Joshua bases his military decision upon the report of the spies. But there's no indication in the text that Joshua takes time to pray. Joshua makes this decision without asking God for permission and without asking God for direction. Perhaps Joshua thinks that he only needs God for the big things and that he can handle the little things on his own. Now, if Joshua had taken the time to pray, God would have told him that there's a problem among the people that has to be resolved before victory can be possible again. Someone has said, some of the biggest mistakes you'll ever be, you'll ever make in your Christian life will be those no-brainer decisions. You know, those times when you look at everything, weigh things logically, and then decide, all without seeking God in prayer. Jesus reminds us in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. It's better to talk to God first than to wait and have to spend time cleaning up your messes because you forgot to pray. Israel puts its confidence in its army's power, not in God's power. And Israel loses as a result. Works the same way today. If we think we can handle the so-called little things on our own without God, we may soon find that we lose too. We need to learn to depend upon God for everything, both the big things and the little things. False belief number two, a little sin is hardly a problem. Israel wins the war against Jericho with the understanding that the entire city is to be burned and all the precious metals are to go into God's treasury. In other words, the people are to take no spoils and no treasures for themselves. And everybody understands and follows the procedure except one man. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1 indicates that Achan takes some of the things that should have been devoted to God. Achan explains his own sin in verse 21. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. Achan knew the law. He knew the rules, but he chose to break it. So what was Achan thinking? You know, perhaps he thinks to himself, what I take will never be missed. You know, there are hundreds of Babylonian garments there are many wedges of gold and countless silver shekels. I'm only going to take a small amount, and that's not going to hurt anybody or anything. Nobody's going to suffer with me taking a few things. 
This is hardly a problem. It's interesting that Achan doesn't call his sin stealing from God. He calls his sin helping himself to a little plunder. We too tend to minimize our sin or explain away our sin. We call it a fib or a white lie instead of admitting that we told an untruth. We call it creative bookkeeping instead of stealing. We call it sharing concerns instead of gossiping. We call it having an affair instead of committing adultery. We call it self-confidence instead of pride. We too have a way of minimizing our sin. We put it down all the time. We don't see sin as a big deal. And many times we find ourselves thinking that sin really doesn't matter. But this story teaches that sin is a serious matter. A little sin can be a big problem. False belief number three, I can hide my sin. Achan knows that taking those things from Jericho is wrong. And because he knows he did wrong, he tries to hide the evidence under the floor of his tent. Achan finally admits in verse 21, they are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Achan believes that he can hide his sin and nobody will ever find out. And Achan doesn't confess his sin until he's forced to do so. I mean, Achan could have admitted to Joshua immediately what he did, but instead he waits until there's this lottery and he is pointed out as the culprit in verse 18. Achan isn't sorry for what he did. He's simply sorry that he got caught. Many times we also try to hide things from God and other people. But sooner or later, the truth comes to the surface. Someone said that trying to hide your sin is like trying to hold a beach ball underwater. Now, you can keep it there for a while, but eventually it will surface. The Bible says in Numbers 32, 23, be sure that your sin will find you out. You can hide your sin in the short term, but your sin has a way of becoming known in the long term. What are you trying to hide from God and other people? Do you think it's hidden away in your computer? Do you think it's safely concealed under lock and key in a cabinet? Do you think those thoughts of jealousy, bitterness, and hatred are secretly stored away inside your heart? God sees your sin, and he wants you to deal with it, not hide it. Your sin won't remain hidden forever. False belief number four, my sin isn't hurting anyone. We often try to convince ourselves that my sin may be hurting me, but it's not hurting anybody else. But reality tells a different story. Look at verses 24 and 25. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor, Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? 
The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Now, this conclusion to the story may sound a little barbaric to our modern ears. You know, maybe we can buy into the fact that they executed Achan. But his family? His animals? I mean, what did they have to do with this? I mean, this is Achan's sin, not theirs. We live in an age of hyper-individualism in which we think, what I do is my business. What you do is your business. So let's just mind our own business. But it doesn't work that way. Our lives are intertwined. And it doesn't matter how secret a sin might be. Its consequences will spill over onto other people. My sin can't be isolated from you, and your sin can't be isolated from me. There's a question that we rarely consider, but one that has consequences every single day. The question is this, how much is your sin going to cost me? Our sin has consequences upon everyone close to us. Achan's sin costs him dearly, but the consequences didn't stop there. His sin impacts his whole family. His sin impacts the entire nation. The troops get routed because of Achan's sin. 36 soldiers lose their life because of Achan's sin. Joshua and the Israelites are humiliated because of Achan's sin. I think about children saying to their parents, How much is your sin going to cost me? If a parent is angry all the time, bitter, selfish, greedy, disrespectful, dishonest, how much is that going to cost their children? Or what about a parent who can't keep his word? He says, yes, I'll be there at your school play, but he never shows up. Or, I'll take you fishing, but he never does. How much is that parent's sin going to cost that child? Spouses can look each other in the eye and ask, How much is your sin going to cost me? Your bad habits, your addictions, your anger issue, your lack of commitment, your lack of stability, how much are all of those things going to cost me? It's going to cost me a few years of my life? What chunk of our savings is your sin going to cost us? Now, we might think it's barbaric, That Achan's family dies along with him because of his sin. But have we ever stopped to consider the emotional cost that our sin has on our loved ones? How much damage has our sin done to the hearts of the people we love? How much damage has our sin done to the dreams of the people we love? Instead of thinking that your sin isn't hurting anyone else, you need to remind yourself that your sin is hurting everybody else. Get past yourself. Stop being your own worst enemy. Quit trying to convince yourself that you can do the wrong thing and still get a good result. Trust God to handle all things in your life. 
recognize that even a little sin can be a big problem. Confess your sins. Make things right with God and with other people. And then realize that your sin can have huge consequences for every single person in your life. How much is your sin costing the people in your life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've touched upon a tragic story. It's a story of how one person's influence, one person's sin, one person's selfishness, one person's bad decision has impacted an entire nation. It impacted his family. It impacted Israel. It impacted the battlefield. It impacted the blessing of God. Father, many times in our modern world, we don't think of sin as being all that serious. We don't think it's a big deal. And Father, that's true because many times we don't really understand how much our sin is impacting not just ourselves, but everyone close to us. Father, may we be people who take sin seriously and confess it to you. Receive forgiveness. And then make changes. Repent. Turn around. Go the other way. Do the right thing. Father, may we stop trying to convince ourselves that we can do the wrong thing and still get good results. It ends up in a disaster. And Father, may we avoid that. May we instead be honest and open before you. Father, thank you that you are the God of forgiveness. Father, thank you that because of Jesus, all of our sins can be forgiven. Thank you that the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us from every single sin. Father, thank you for good news. That today we can start over. That today we can be forgiven. That today there's a new opportunity to do the right thing. Father, it's my prayer for all of us that we would not become our own worst enemy. That we would not play mind games with ourselves. That our eyes would be wide open to our influence in our family, in our church, in our neighborhood. Father, help us to understand that what we do matters. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to conclude today by giving you just a few seconds to talk to God. What has God said to you today? And what do you need to say to God in response? So I just want to encourage you. Maybe there's a sin you need to confess. Maybe there's something that you've been excusing and you need to stop. Whatever God is saying to you, obey Him, trust Him, believe Him. He wants the best for you. Talk to Him during this moment of silence.